Hello and welcome to Read with Ronald. Today we will be reading the third book in the Lost Fleet series, Courageous. If you would like to know how I got into reading this series and why I'm reading it, be sure to check out my introduction to the Lost Fleet video. So before we get started, I want to give you a spoiler warning and let you know that we'll be reviewing the whole plot. And if that's not what you're interested in, then thank you for watching up to this point. And feel free to go ahead and turn off the video here. And maybe if you decide that you want to come back and see what I have to say on this book after you read it for yourself, then then feel free. Courageous starts off with the fleet. They arrive in the new star system, which is the Balder star system. They immediately take out a merchant ship that was like right next to the gate when they arrive. And so it's not a very, you know, like strenuous battle and they collect the survivors from the ship and Gary wants to interrogate them. And so he wants to get through this system quickly because they're low on supplies and they need to replenish. You know, they just replenished in Sansir, but he notices that the supplies are critically low, which he's like, why is this like this? And so he contacts Tyrosian, who of course he put in charge of the auxiliaries in the last book. She tells him that it's because the systems that they've been using to gauge their supplies are engineered to like recommend collecting supplies based on heavy losses because as we've established, the Alliance has basically just been throwing the ships at the syndicate and because of the way Geary has been training them to not take heavy losses, the system recommendations have not been updated yet. And so Geary, he's kind of pissed off at Tyrosian that she didn't tell him about this, that when she discovered it, she didn't say nothing. So he's like, should I relieve her of command? And I'm like, how are you going to relieve her of command? She just got her position. They have to stay a little bit longer than they expected because they got to get the supplies. Today is October 10th and I've been reading Courageous, right? the third book in the Lost Fleet series. I've been reading it for the past few days. I want justice for my girl, Captain Tyrosian. They are playing in her face. As we all know, Captain Tyrosian recently got promoted to the head of the auxiliary division, right? Just got it. We get to this book and all of a sudden it's this captains and commanders versus engineers dynamic going on. Tyrosian is in the middle of it because there was an oversight, not by the engineers, but an oversight by the technology because the way Geary has been commanding, the technology has not updated to reflect it. So because the technology has not updated to reflect it, all of the supplies they got when they was in Sansir, all of a sudden, it, it's not enough. And so all of the blame is being laid on Tyrosian for this. Geary talking about, I might need to figure out a way to get her out of the position. I'm like, she just got in the position. You just put her in the position. You was lauding her for how great of an amazing person she was. Now all of a sudden she made one mistake that's really not even her fault. It is, but it isn't. And already you thinking about replacing her. Like, she just got here. So I need some justice for my Captain Tyrosia. He decides that they're going to raid some syndicate mines to get their supplies. He holds a conference. As we established in the last book, Numos and Fariza got arrested. So they are no longer captains. And so in their place as opponents come Cassia and Yin. Cassia is over a different ship. But because Numos and Fariza had such a big presence, he wasn't really all that noticeable. And Yin has taken Numos's place as the captain of his ship. But basically the purpose of these two is to basically fill in the role that Numos and Fariza left behind. They just do the same thing that them two did. Every meeting, you know, he tells the plan. They give opposition, indirectly question his command, stuff like that. You know, same old, same old, nothing new. So they do this and everybody starts debating his leadership. They start debating whether he's showing favoritism to certain captains. He's fighting the temptation to just start relieving everybody because, you know, that's something that Black Jack Geary would do. And he's trying his hardest to avoid being Black Jack Geary because he wants to remain Captain John. Geary but it's getting harder and harder to keep Blackjack in check but so far he's been successfully doing it he's successful at not firing everybody this time and he's like this is what we're gonna do we're gonna raid these mines we're gonna get our supplies and we're gonna avoid battle because we don't have the supplies to be going into battle and everybody's disappointed by this so then they get to carrying out the plan and while they're carrying out the plan Geary goes to his stateroom and Ryan shows up. They talk about how he's feeling and how he is struggling to keep Black Jack Geary in check and how he's so emotionally affected by the loss of his ships as compared to everybody else's indifference. You know, at the beginning of the first book when they sent the captains off to negotiate and they got, you know, shot down and stuff like that. Ryan suggests that some of those captains may have lived and may be, you know, captured and being interrogated for information. And she suggests in an effort to get home faster that Gary just abandoned some of the ships and moved their crews to different ships so they can, they can get home faster and lose a dead weight. But Gary is like, no, because he doesn't want to lose ships. He doesn't want to cause morale to decline. Things between them 
romantically. They're rocky. He gets called down to intelligence to interrogate. And this scene basically plays out how the last interrogation of a syndic played out. They get to the mining facility, send the marines down to go do what they need to do. Gary notices amongst his ships that all of his problem captains are captains of battleships and captains of battleships in the third division specifically. And he's confused by this because he's like, back in my day, battleships were for like the captains who proven they were like the best of the best. Makes it a point to figure out what's going on with this. But as they're carrying out the plan, Gary notices that the people who are at the mining facility, they're fighting to protect the facility. They're like fighting and retreating. He's like, why are they doing that? And so he suspects that it might be a trap. The people guarding the mining facility are security guards and not military. He's like, why did they got security guards guarding this? mining facility and fighting against us. So he gets on video call with Carrie Valley, you know, the commander of the Marines, to like ask her what's going on. And she's like, um, Captain, this is what's going on, but you know, I need to kind of like keep an eye on everything that's going on. So if you don't mind, you know, she says it respectfully. She suggests withdrawing the troop until they can like assess the situation correctly. But Ryan, she's like, nah, these people are just bluffing. It's not a real threat. They're just bluffing to stop for time until they can get some reinforcements out here. He tries to make a compromise where he's like, okay, I'm going to back Ryan and say that it's a bluff, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to let the auxiliary engineers see your video feeds. They can assess like what's in there that doesn't need to be in the mining facility and what could be used and set up as a trap or a weapon, right? Karabali doesn't like this. She's like, somebody's trying to access my video feeds from my Marines. And Gary's like, I know it's me letting the engineers see. And she's like, no, we can't have this. Everybody just basically gets to arguing about how this is a bad idea. And so Gary is like, you know what, fine. Forget the whole idea. What we're going to do is this. Things are going through the mining facility. They realize that everything is still operating. And so because everything is operating, they have to power everything down. Then have to restart everything one by one to ensure that it's, you know, hasn't been rigged to be a trap and stuff like this. And that's going to take a lot of time. So then Commander Loman, who is commander over one of the auxiliary ships, he comes into the video call to inform Tyrosian mobile mining units. They're ready to go. Gary, he's never heard of this. So he's like, what does this do? It mines the supplies they need. And so poor Tyrosian, she's sitting up here trying to fight for her life because she already in hot water because she didn't say anything in the first place about what was going on. And now she got this commander that's under her trying to undermine her in front of Captain Gary. So she's She's doing her best trying to act like, oh yeah, this was my plan all along, but Gary can tell that it was not, but he's he's having mercy on her. Do you see me here talking to somebody? Quit hollering at people, you know, I don't need this. So they deploy the units, security guard, minor people, they start fighting back. Gary comes up with this plan, so he's like, this is what we gonna do. We gonna get our supplies. After we get our supplies, everybody get within like this range away from the mining facility and you know, destroy stuff as you go. And then we're gonna have the ships destroy the mining facility from above. It's successful. They leave just enough supplies for the security guards to subsist on until they can get some help. And then Gary holds another meeting. And this new captain, Captain Badiah, he makes a suggestion of repeating basically the big hypernet thing that they did in the last book where they destroyed the hypernet and basically being like, ooh, if we do that, maybe we can end the war faster. And Cressida's like, we're not doing that. Cressida is Duelos, it's Tulev, and it's a few other captains that saying we're not going to do this. And so Gary's like, why are all these specific captains who are on my side coming to my defense? He finds that a little suspicious. He announces his next plan, which is to take a more direct path to aligned space, you know, to save time. And because it's unexpected and because he thinks the syndicates are trying to catch on to the fact that they go all around the world. And so the meeting ends. Duelo stays behind as usual. He tells Gary that he thinks that Cassia is trying to take Numos and Faris's position as the leader of like the opposition against Gary in the fleet because they can't do nothing from jail. And so now there's like a power vacuum in the opposition against Gary and Cassie is trying to become the victor. And he also tells Gary that he's surprised that Gary is not like spying on his captains, trying to root out who's for him and who's against him. And Gary's like, I'm not doing that because that's not how things were done back in my day. And Drello says, well, that's surprising because that's how things are done now. And I'm surprised you haven't already started doing that. And so then they get on the topic of Ryan. She's been off her game lately. She, you know, hasn't been offering advice as usual. The people of the republics that she are over, they haven't seen much of her. And then Geary asks him about, you know, like the whole battleship, battlecruiser, captain situation. And Dolus is like, oh yeah, you know, the terrible captains, they get put on battleships and the good captains get put on battlecruisers. And Geary realizes it's because battlecruisers are faster. 
And because the Alliance's strategy is now just throw ships at the enemy at the fastest rate possible and hope something happens, it makes sense that all the good captains will be put on the ships that go faster. And he's like, that's just such a waste of good captains. And then there are also rumors that Gary and Dejani are involved with each other. And when I was seeing this, I was like, did we forget about the man that Dejani was supposed to be seeing? Like, why is she all of a sudden getting thrown in the love triangle? Gary inquires about why all of these certain captains he knows are on his team all of a sudden are on his team. And Jealous is like, oh, it's because Cressida told us about, you know, the stuff with the hypernet. And we've all come to an agreement that that information needs to be protected. She didn't tell us everything, but she told us enough. And so then Gary lets Dwellus in on his alien theory. They talk a little bit about that. Gary telling Dwellus, if I don't make it home, I'm leaving you in charge of the fleet. And Dwellus is like, I don't think I'm gonna be as good as a captain as you are, but I'm gonna do my best. I'm one third of the way through the book and I have to get some thoughts off of my head. First of all, I don't wanna say it hasn't been as good as the first two books but it hasn't been as engaging that's the best way i can put it because a lot of what the first third of the book has been has just been repeated scenes from the first two books i wouldn't be surprised if he literally just took the scenes from the previous books and pasted them in this book word for word and just changed some things around to make them fit the situation because a lot of the scenes are just repeats of stuff we've already read but we spent the first three chapters mind you these chapters are like 25 to 30 pages long. These are really chunky chapters. Look, the first three chapters is spent on replenishing our supplies in this star system that we just arrived in. Then we've got this whole love triangle that isn't a love triangle between Geary, Ryan, and Dejani because there's a rumor going around that they're all in a love triangle, but it's not really a love triangle because as we remember, Dejani is supposed to be with this other guy ain't been no mention of him and Gary and Ryan they're having issues in their situationship to top it all off we got rid of Numos and Fariza right just for two new people to take their place all of like the battleship captains especially in the division that Numos and Fariza are in they're captains because they were deemed not good leader they were deemed eligible to command but they're not good commanders so they've been basically banished to battleships as opposed to battle cruisers which is where the good commanders go which is kind of flip flop to how it was when gary was in his time numos and fariza were considered to be like terrible commanders and that's why they were put on battleships they were put in what is considered to be the dumping ground of the divisions where all the bad commanders go so they were literally the worst of the worst right well after they get arrested now we get a new person Cassia coming out trying to take their place because there's been a power vacuum in the division left behind by them two being fired so now he's trying to take his place and then commander yin who was under numos is basically the new fariza but she's not a very effective one like fariza was they basically have filled the roles that numos and fariza fill and i'm just like really i still don't trust captain dwellers i still don't trust him something about him is making me not trust him and even he questions why gary is so trusting my thing is i'm one fourth of the way to the book right and it's just not engaging it's not as engaging as the first two were because a lot of it is repeated information and the new storylines that are being introduced it just seemed like drama for the sake of drama i'm hoping it was just a slow start and the book will pick up but right now it's looking very 3.5 ish the next star system that they're going to is the system of sendai and so they get in the jump space he just let loose all his worries on ryan he goes and talks to them ancestors that can't do nothing for him because they're dead it's given this is far in the future of Earth, like Earth's still a thing, which means God is a thing. So why are we talking to our ancestors who can't do nothing for us? I need y'all to get a relationship with the Lord and go talk to the Lord who can actually do something for you. So I just wanted to do a quick little interjection here because I realize I sound very harsh on ancestral worship. Now, I do want to start this off by saying that I stand on what I said, but I also want to offer a Christian perspective as to why it's not of God. And I do understand that this is the culture of the book, but I just want to let y'all know now that every Every time it comes up, I'm not going to be kind to it. So I know y'all came here for the book plot. So if you're not interested in hearing what I'm about to say, you can go ahead and skip to the next section. So I'm going to try to make this very quick because I don't want to be here all day. Just like I know y'all don't want to be here all day. Number one, the Bible tells us that we should not have any God before the Lord our God. And by the Lord our God, it means Jesus Christ who came down to earth and died for our sins. It did number two. The Bible tells us not to put our trust in men, but to put our trust in the Lord because humans, they're human. They make mistakes. They don't always get it right. 
They're not always trustworthy. But God, he's constant. He's consistent. He's good. He has good intentions towards you. Yes, he might put you in some tough situations to mature you and grow you and make you stronger spiritually and increase your faith and trust in him. Whereas man, they might have the best intentions for you, but they might get it wrong. They might mess up. They might lead you into something that'll have you looking stupid and foolish. And granted, the context of this verse is in the context of don't put your trust in men who are alive. They're on the earth with you. I feel like it should be said that if they are not worth putting trust in and total faith in on the face of the earth, then you really can't put trust in them when they have gone to wherever they went, whether it be heaven or hell, because they didn't have no power to do nothing while they were here. So what makes you think they're going to have power to do something now that they've died? They can't do nothing for you outside of what God allows them to do and what God has positioned them to do and has taxed them to do on the face of the earth. And before y'all start coming at me talking about something, well, what about this? What about that? Look, I'm not God. I'm not knowledgeable about all his ways either. Okay, I just trust him. I just have faith in him. Like the Bible says, his ways are not our ways. The third and final reasoning comes from Luke 16, 19 through 31, which is the story of Lazarus and the rich man. It's a parable, but it's an explanation how your choices lead you to heaven and hell. And an explanation of how you're not able to come back after you died. So there was Lazarus and there was this rich man. Lazarus was poor and sick. Lazarus was, you know, begging for help. The rich man, he wanted to be rich. He didn't want to help Lazarus. They both end up dying. Lazarus go to heaven. Rich man go to hell. Lazarus up there chilling with Abraham in heaven and the rich man can see them. He's like, oh, Abraham, please send Lazarus down here just to, you know, relieve me a little bit. It's hot down here. I can't, it's agony down here. And Abraham's like, he can't do nothing for you. Like, even if he wanted to, there's a chasm between us. We can't cross over. You can't cross over to us. We literally can't do nothing for you. This is what y'all chose. Lazarus was poor and he was sick, but he chose to put his trust in the Lord and he's in heaven. Happy, healthy, whole. You chose riches. You chose not to put your trust in the Lord. If you choose to put your faith in anything other than the Lord, you're going to have a bad time. Those things cannot do anything for you outside of what the Lord allows them to do. The rich man is like, oh, well, can you at least send him to go warn my family of what's to come? And Abraham's like, I can't do that either. They got Moses. They got the prophets. They need to listen to them if they want to know what's to come. And the rich man is like, oh, well, they might not listen. But if you send Lazarus, they might listen to him. And Abraham's like, well, if they won't listen to the people who are there, who are saying what God is telling them to say and warning them of what is to come and warning them of what God's will is, then they're not going to listen to somebody who's died. The reason it ties in, like Abraham said, Lazarus. Number one, he can't go back. He's in heaven. He's rejoicing. And honestly, I'm going to bring this up too. With Samuel and Saul, when Saul went to the witch and committed a sin doing witchcraft and brought Samuel back to talk to him because he wanted to find out how he could reclaim being king from David. And Samuel told him, what'd you call me back here for? I'm in heaven with the Lord rejoicing. Why would you bring me back to this ghetto? The Lord has allowed me to come back here and tell you. Once again, you're done. You're not king no more. It's over. You blew it. The reason I bring that up is because people who are in heaven rejoicing with the Lord, they don't want to come back. Lazarus is where he is. He's in heaven with the Lord. The rich man is where he is. And the people on earth, they still have the opportunity to make the decision on where they're going to end up by whether heeding the warning of the prophets or not. I'm going to wrap it up. You should have no other God before the Lord, number one. But number two, you should have no other God but the Lord. Like the Lord should be your only God. And number three, because in this parable, as it pointed out, that's my little sermon. And so with that being said, I'm going to let y'all get back to the book plot. And if you feel led after this to, you know, seek a relationship with Jesus, I highly encourage it. He goes and talks to them ancestors that can't do nothing for him because they're dead. But I digress. He lets loose about his worries about leading the fleet and about aliens, and about Ryan. And then he goes down to intelligence. Because intelligence discovered letters in the mining facility that showcase that the syndicates are not really all that happy with the war going on. They're not happy with their leadership. They're not happy with the war effort. But Gary realizes the only reason they're supporting the syndicates is because the syndicate is spreading fear of the alliance and spreading fear that the alliance is going to come and destroy them all and kill them all. But he's like, we just got to keep, you know, doing our best to make a change and make a difference and change opinion. And hopefully if we change that opinion far enough, the syndicate people will finally take a stand against the government and help us win this war. In Jump Space, Ryan has been avoiding Gary. Gary's been running simulations to figure out how he can improve the fleet, make it to where he can protect the battle cruisers because he really needs them. And they contain all his good captains. Get the fleet to working how it used to work back in the day. Then they arrive in Sendai, which is a wrecked hot mess because it's a black hole that's tearing the system apart. And everybody on the ship is scared because they've never seen a black hole in person except for Gary, who apparently they used to take 
field trips to black holes back in the day, but now they don't do that no more. So nobody's ever seen one before. Everybody's intimidated and scared and Gary's like, yeah, we're gonna get out here as fast as possible. And so the next system they're gonna go to is Daquan. It's probably pronounced Daquan, but it's spelled Daquan. So I'm gonna call it Daquan. Right before they get ready to jump, Dejani comes visit. They get to talking about like their personal life. So then they jump to Daquan and when they get there, they run straight into battle at the gate. It's an easy battle and Gary's like, this battle went a little too easily. Something ain't right. In the battle, they lost some ship. And Gary, you know, he's kind of depressed about that. And so he's still trying to figure out a way to like preserve his ships and not take any more losses. So in the battle, they lost two ships and that's kind of lowered morale a little bit. Gary's depressed about it. And then Ryan finally stops avoiding Gary and comes to see him. And she reveals that the reason that she's been so distant is because in one of the previous books, when they found a list of all like the potential survivors, she saw her husband's name on that list. And she's like, oh my gosh, my husband might be alive. And I just cheated on him with you. And even though I still love him, I gave my body to you. I'm such a disgrace. I've disgraced my marriage. I've disgraced my ancestors. I've disgraced my honor. And that's why she's been basically avoiding Gary. And Gary is like, well, how could you have known that he would possibly be alive? But she's not listening. They get into it. And so this discovery is the reason that she and Dejani were beefing because Dejani found out about it because, of course, she saw the list because she's the captain of the ship. So she saw the list. She saw the husband's name. She's like, you need to tell Gary before things between y'all get too serious because I don't want you hurting him. And Ryan, she is like, it's none of his business. And that's why they was beefing because Dejani thought Gary should know. And Ryan was like, it's none of his business. He tells her it's not as bad as she thinks. How could you have known? Don't blame yourself. Go do the ancestral talk. Take Dejani with you. She's like, why would I take Dejani with me? That, that ain't none of her business to be talking to my ancestors. She leaves and comes back hours later drunk. I talked with the ancestors and they're ashamed of me. Now that I've made myself a plaything, I might as well be a plaything and starts taking her clothes off for Gary. And Gary's like, okay, girl, no, we're not doing this. She passes out in his bed. He goes run simulations. He runs into Dejani who tells him, oh, I went with Ryan to go do what she needed to do and um, it didn't go too well. And she also tells him about the rumors that she's heard about him and her being involved. And Gary tells her, as long as we act professional, nothing should be a problem. And Dejani, of course, she's like, okay, yeah, I can do that. Gary spent the night sleeping in his chair, in his stateroom. So the next morning, Ryan wakes up. She's like, what happened? I don't remember what happened. And Gary's like, we didn't do nothing. He's like, I don't know whether I should be grateful or embarrassed. And so she's just feeling really down about herself. So Gary's like, you know what? You need to snap out of it and get over it. That pisses her off. They get into an argument and Gary storms out of the room and goes down to the conference room to go run some more simulation. They're going to this star system called Ixion and he's prepared for an ambush. He's like, so I need to be fully prepared that the syndicates are going to be at that gate waiting for us. So he calls another meeting as he Again, being a hot mess, talking about Ryan and Gary, talking about Dejani and Gary, doing everything except what they're supposed to be talking about. It's the same thing every meeting. Gary says the plan, the opposition come against him in the plan, Gary puts them in their place, they come against him with Ryan and Dejani and whatever else he got going on, and you know, you want to take control, you're not letting us vote. Same old, same old bullcrap every meeting. After the meeting, Geary talks to Captain Bedaya, who basically tells him, you need to become a dictator and we'll support you. Because when you get back to Alliance, you're going to find that it's not going to be the same Alliance that it was when you left 100 years ago. Things have changed. Nobody really trusts the government of the Alliance. And so you can really come in and take over and everybody will like bend to your will. And Geary's like, I'm not doing that. But he's really tempted by this offer. So he wants to talk to Ryan. Ryan's like, I'll think about it. So then she comes down like hours later to talk. And she tells him that the true threats to him are not Cassia and Midia. Midia is another captain that's been doing the most. She tells him that they are not his true threats. His true threats are the people who are going to willingly follow him blindly, but can't think for themselves. And she tells him that Kazi and Midia aren't even really threats. She thinks they're pawns of somebody else who's leading the opposition against him, but she doesn't know for sure who it is yet. She's still feeling down about herself, but she's going to resume her position as his bed partner and as leader of the republics and as politician because she's like, you're right, I got to at least do my job. He's concerned her sudden change in attitude. He's like, is she planning to backstab me? She might be planning to backstab me. But he's not too concerned because he let her in the bed. Did you graduate from high school? So they jump for Ixion. They're back in jump space. Gary is restless because he just wants to know, like, is it an ambush already? Was all my planning in vain? Finally exit. And he was right. It's an ambush at the gate. The battle is a hot mess because the syndicate, they weren't all the way prepared yet. So when they got to fight in, they basically fight in each other. They're taking each other out and Gary is like, 
what is going on with them? Like, they fighting like they ain't never fought before. And Dejani's like, it's because they kept switching captains. You taking them out so quickly that they just basically shoving people into positions who ain't never flown a ship before. They take out the ships at the gate and Giri is like, this battle was a little too easy. As more information starts coming in from the system, he realizes that there are syndicates at every gate. Oh, so it didn't matter which point we was coming out of. They was going to be at any gate. And so he realizes the syndicate is starting to catch on to him. So after the battle, you know, him and Ryan, they get to arguing about where they're going next. He's not really for sure where they're going to go next. And then they get to talking about Dejani and his relationship and how she's so devoted to him. And, you know, Ryan's giving jealous, but she claims she's not jealous because she's so in love with her husband, but she's giving jealous. And Ryan wonders if Gary is jealous of Blackjack because Blackjack, he can do whatever he wants to get away with it. And Gary can't do that because he's trying to prove that he's not going to be a hero that's going to ruin everything and get everybody killed. He gets the bright idea to go talk to Captain Falco. Falco is in confinement because he's mentally ill. But Falco still believes he's in charge of the fleet. So Gary, first he talks to the doctor. The doctor is like, oh, he's suffering from a Geary complex. And basically a Geary complex is named after Gary. Basically believing that you will be the single-handed savior of the Alliance. And so Gary's like... Do I got a Geary complex? Is that why Ryan don't trust me like that? Doctor recommends that Falco remain untreated because if he's treated and he realizes the state that he's in, it'll cause him to become depressed. It'll cause him to maybe consider doing some things he wouldn't consider doing while he's not being treated. And so Geary, he's kind of conflicted about that because he's like, dang, if I can get him better, why wouldn't I want to get him better? But if getting him better means he'll be a danger to himself, I don't want that. So after talking to the doctor, he talks to Falco. Falco believes he's in charge of the ship. He gives the idea to go to Lakota because he's like, Lakota, they wouldn't expect us to go there. And so Gary, after the talk, he's feeling a little bad for Falco. And I feel kind of bad for exploiting him like this, but I had to do it so I could like get some outside perspective because the syndicates are starting to catch on. And Ryan is like, Lakota, where you get this idea from? You got this idea from Falco. So they argue about it. And basically Gary gets her on board with them to go to Lakota, right? And another reason Falco suggests going to Lakota is because Lakota has a hypernet. If they can get to the hypernet, they can use it to get closer to Alliance space. Ryan doesn't think it's a good idea. And she also reveals that the Republic, they are split in loyalty because they're loyal to Gary because he's doing such great things and keeping them safe and getting them to where they need to go. But also they're still, you know, loyal to Ryan because she's their politician. She's over them. So they're split in loyalty. And she's concerned that if it came down to it, they're going to follow Geary over her. She hasn't been as combative with Geary when it comes to his choices on where to go because so far he's been right on everything. And so she's like, well, since you've been right on everything and I've been wrong on everything, it's no point in wasting my breath. And so Geary calls a meeting. He announces Lakota as the objective. The third division steers it to arguing about Ryan as a politician and why she no longer attends the meetings. And in this meeting, we learn that Orion and Majestic, which are the ships under the command of Commander Yin and Captain Kazia, are the most damaged, like the most damaged battleships in the fleet. Today is October 13th. I find it very interesting that the usual suspects who be doing all the complaining are the ones with the badly damaged ships. I'm really not surprised. But they have the most to say on the auxiliaries and their abilities. Yeah, I find it funny how y'all the most mouthy about the auxiliaries, but y'all the most damaged. And y'all the ones needing to rely on them the most. And so then Captain Midia gets herself in the mix as well. And Badiah, after the meeting, is like, you need to relieve her of command. She has a history of being, you know, difficult to work with, being disruptive and disorderly. She got a few cases herself of messing with some officers as well. So um, she's not a good captain and you need to relieve her. And Geary's like, I'm not really thinking of doing that. So Geary then confides in Dwellos about what Badiah said about him being a dictator. And Dwellos tells him the odds of his dictatorship and who would and who would not support him. Dwellos himself says he would not support it but he believes that Johnny would and so then as the fleet is getting ready to jump to Lakota the syndicates come in behind them and are following them to Lakota and then while they're in jump space to Lakota him and Ryan talk and Ryan asks him if he remembers seeing what it was like in jump space from cryo sleep because when they're in jump space they can see like lights flickering but they don't know what the lights are that's why she's asking oh do you remember anything maybe you can tell us what it is and he's like I don't know anything I was asleep and then this is when we find out what happened with Riva and Dejani because Dejani comes to talk to him they weren't the same people that they were before he was jealous of her because she was a captain of like basically the flagship of the fleet and he's still a lieutenant and he's not where he thinks he should be and he cheated on her so they broke up and now she's back eligible to be in this love triangle with Gary no! 
And I'm like, so what was the point of bringing him in? He brought nothing to the story. You could have kept him and kept that. She suggests that Ryan is jealous and that she's caught feelings. After they have that conversation, Gary wonders what things would be like for him and Dejani if they were not at war and if he were not her commander, but he fights the feeling. As they're arriving to Lakota Gear, you know, he takes a walk around the ship, gathers intel on like the Alliance government. It's like the crew kind of has similar sentiments towards their government that the syndicates have towards their government. They arrive in Lakota and they instantly notice that it's a flotilla near the hypernet ready to destroy it if they get near it. So Gary's like, we got to figure out a way to get that flotilla away from the hypernet so we can use it. So he comes up with this plan to basically have the auxiliaries hang back with a few ships under the guise of transferring supplies and repairs and stuff like that, hoping that the flotilla will fall for it and attack them so that they can take out the flotilla. Ryan is like, they're not going to fall for that. Midia is like, they're not going to fall for that. They're starting to catch on to his tactics. And so his plan is either use the hypernet or go to Bronwyn. Midia is like, we should make the auxiliaries more attractive by maybe putting you amongst them. That might make them come and attack. And Gary's like, uh, no, we can't do that because I need to stay on this ship. And Midia basically walked him into a trap of talking about him and Dejani and, and him and Ryan and basically the drama between them. His helpers help steer the meeting back on track. Midia decides to offer herself as tribute basically like, oh, let me stay behind in the division. The people staying behind with the auxiliaries are his problem people. After the meeting, Dola's like, you should not have done that because she gonna be a problem. She might stir up a rebellion amongst them while we're like over here trying to create a diversion. Gary's like, well, it might've been a mistake, but it's too late to do anything about it now. And so after the meeting, Ryan gets pissed off with Gary because during the meeting, when they got on the whole topic of them, he basically gave Ryan this look like, don't say nothing. And so she didn't say nothing. And she's like, you basically shut me up in the meeting and wouldn't let me express what I used to say. And you don't think I'm the only one who saw it. So people are going to start thinking now there's some truth to the claim. She's like, you let me handle the politics and you handle the fighting. She tells him to get it together and they get to talking and he's like, I wouldn't be surprised if Midia ended up with a knife in her back and it was you. And she's like, child, if it was me, there would be no evidence that it was me. It's kind of like a veiled threat because earlier in the book when she was drunk, she basically admitted that she would do whatever it took to protect the Alliance, including killing Gary if she deemed it necessary. A reminder of that veiled threat that she made, but she don't remember making it because she was drunk. But Gary remembers it. I am on chapter eight and I just want to say that the book is fighting back. The part that's really just been the most interesting of the book is the political intrigue part. The battles have been kind of a little underwhelming, but that's all right. It's fighting back. After three days, nothing happens. The flotilla doesn't move. They're just heading towards Bronwyn. And then all of a sudden, this other flotilla arrives from Tenegu, right? And it goes to start placing mines at the gate of Bronwyn. So now Gary's like, this is not how I wanted this to go. Ryan's like, they're getting smarter. That's why they got this flotilla here mining the gate and this one by the hypernet gate. And so basically Gary's like, you know what? We just gonna go to Bronwyn. So they're heading for Bronwyn. And so Ryan is confused by this because she's like, why are we going to Bronwyn when we got a hypernet gate right here? And it's not going to take too much to get to it. He basically explains his thinking and his logic and that by taking out the Bronwyn team, it'll even the playing field between them. Three days goes by, it's nothing but arguments and sleeping together. And then when it finally comes time to do the battle, a whole nother flotilla arrives through the hypernet. One of the ships renowned started getting jumped. The way it went is like the same way it went with Gary when he had to do his big thing. And so that's kind of like, you know, triggering and traumatizing to him. And then, because Renown is getting jumped, here go Midia, who is captain of Paladin. She decides to go take her little butt out of formation and go save Renown. But all she do is end up getting both her and Renown killed. The fight comes to an end because the flotilla runs off towards the other flotilla that just arrived. And Gary's like, if we chase them, we're going to get jumped. So he's like, I got to figure something out. Because now we got three flotillas here and everybody coming to jump us. So what he decides to do is he decides to go back to Ixion, but he decides to frame it in a way that's like, we're going to lure them close to the Ixion gate. We're dividing and conquering. And so everybody buys it. So he calls a meeting and Commander Yin makes this suggestion that's like, what if we put the auxiliaries through the gate with like a special force to protect them while everybody else here stays and fight? If we can't get away, then that special force with the auxiliaries will be able to get away. Lee Dwellers is like, 
Um, that sounds like something Captain Numos would suggest, which basically gives proof that she is a pawn of Captain Numos, and Numos is still running things behind the scenes, even though he's supposed to be in jail. Gary shoots down her suggestion and tells them this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna lead them towards Ixion, we're gonna fight at the gate of Ixion, and we're gonna divide and conquer. But what he's really trying to do is trying to get them to the gate of Ixion so they can escape. Dajani comforts him on, you know, having to relive the experience through watching what happened to Renown. She's like, I know you're really making an escape. And I support it because she's like, I finally see like that sometimes it's better to escape and live another day than to go down fighting like Renown and Paladin. And so then after this conversation, Ryan and Geary talk. They just spend a whole bunch of time together doing stuff, coming up with plans, figuring out what they can do to even the playing field. He calls this Captain Saram, who is Captain of Warrior, which is another badly damaged ship. And he's like, I'm going to put you in charge of Orion and Majestic. Y'all are going to protect the auxiliaries in this formation that I'm about to create. And it's vital that y'all do this because we need the auxiliaries. And if you can't do it, let me know now. And so I was like, yeah, I could do it. And so that's what they do. The flotilla that they were fighting, it's been following them to the gate of Ixion, just staying far away enough so that they don't engage, but staying close enough that if your lines decide to break bad, everybody can jump them. So... Basically, they finally get to the gate of Ixion, and then they start fighting again. He loses some ships. The syndicates lose a lot more ships. And so then they start breaking for Ixion to get up out of there. But because of how much syndicate opposition there is, Geary is like, the only way we're going to make it is if we sacrifice some ships to like deal with them while we make our break for it. So the 7th Division decides to volunteer as a sacrifice. The rest are able to make it to the gate, but when they arrive at the gate... More syndicates come out the gate. So they take out them syndicates and then they go to Ixion. And Giri is depressed because he's like, oh my gosh, we lost so many ships. Ryan, you know, she tried to talk him out of it, but Giri's not really hearing her. She's like, you need to become Blackjack because you are Blackjack. Everybody believes in Blackjack and you can be Blackjack. It's not enough to get him out of it. And so I wrote that this was given... David and Absalom, because if you're not aware in the Bible, he had multiple children by multiple wives, and his son Absalom decided that he was going to basically stage a coup and take over the kingdom from David. I'm not going to say that was his favorite son, but David kind of had like a soft heart towards Absalom, even though Absalom was trying to kill him. So one of David's advisors, Joab, decides to take matters into his own hands, kill Absalom for him. Everybody you know is celebrating, they're happy because the war is over, but David's like, oh my son, my son, they've taken my son, they killed my son. And Joab is like, you need to snap out of it. You basically sitting up here grieving this son that just tried to kill you. You basically gonna make everybody feel bad for winning the war. And so that snaps David out of it. It's a small little rant. Joab got on my nerves. All of this, I got your back, David. Getting on to David, doing all of this with David, just in the end to be a snake and turn on David when David was deemed too old to rule. Even though they're not the ones who decide who rule in the first place. God decided that. And it was already decided that Solomon was going to be the next king. But they decided, no, we're going to put somebody else on the throne. I think he's one of the most irritating people in the Bible I have ever read. Because that's what it reminded me of. And Geary is depressed because he's like, oh my gosh, we lost so many ships. Ryan, you know, she tried to talk him out of it, but Geary's not really hearing her. So then she's like, well, you're not going to hear from me. Maybe you need to hear from somebody in your position. So then hours later, she sends in Dejani to go talk to him. And Dejani's like, look, not everybody is going to live. Not everybody's going to make it. You know, we're prepared for this. This is what we do. We knew the risk going into this. They went out honorably and it does the trick. Intelligence is like, sir, we need to see you. So he goes down there and the intelligence officer is like, sir, I don't know how to tell you this, but um, we obtained information that was flying back and forth between the syndicates when they first arrived at the hypernet. And they were surprised to get there. And Gary's like, what do you mean they were surprised? They were like, they were going somewhere else. And so when they arrived, they was like, what is we doing here? And Gary's like, maybe they changed courses in, while they was in the hypernet. Intelligence officer's like, that's not possible. When you set your course, that's where you going. They make it clear that they did not change course. They don't know how they got there. And so Gary is like, so you mean to tell me that they set out for this one location and ended up in Lakota where we were? And they don't know how they got there. And the intelligence officer is like, yes, sir, that's exactly what I'm telling you. And so Gary's like theory on there being alien. The intelligence officer is like, maybe it might be possible, maybe, but we're not for sure. All we know is they wasn't expecting to be there. And so this is more proof of Gary's alien theory. So he goes and talks to Ryan. He's like, now we basically can't use the hypernets now because it's useless. Because if they can just direct us anywhere where they want to go, we might not even end up where we're trying to be at. And even worse, we could end up in further in syndicate space again. 
And so Ryan's like, either they're trying to take us out or maybe they're for us and they believe that you'd find a way out. And Gary's like, well, this is just ridiculous. And so then Gary's like, well, how would they even have known where we were to direct the syndicates to us? And so Ryan's like, maybe there's a spy on board that's masquerading as a human. So they get to Ixion, he gathers his nerves. He's like, you know what? We not going out like this. Everybody, turn around. We going back to Lakota. We going to take these syndicates out. And Ryan's like, what are you talking about? He's like, we going to Lakota. We finna go fight. So they go back to Lakota and that's how the book ends. Well, today is October 20th and I just finished Courageous. I gave it a 3.75. It did a lot of that reusing previous like scenes and stuff from previous books and basically just reusing them like word for word. But that kind of took away from the reading experience. But outside of that, the book was, it was okay. It really wasn't up to the same level as the first two books. It's just a lot going on. I'm really not sure how I feel about where we're going with this. I'm excited to see how they're going to pull this off. This going back to Lakota after we just got beat and we just realized that the syndics were directed to Lakota and they didn't even know how they got there. I'm excited to see how we're going to pull this off. It's a lot of interesting concepts that are going on. And the fact that we are reusing scenes instead of just writing new ones when we have all these interesting concepts to work with just baffles me. But I gave the book a 3.75. Hopefully the next book don't do this mess. I gave this book a 3.75. And a big reason for that is because it kept reusing scenes from the first two books. Like, just like how in God Don't Like Ugly series, how Miss Mary kept rehashing the details and like the rehashes would like change some of the details and so it wasn't consistent this book straight up just took scenes from previous books and reused them and just changed the names and the locations and called it a day and i was like it's not fun to reread scenes you've already read before it's nothing new it's nothing new coming from it no new information we're not getting anything from it we barely got anything from it the first time and it's not as impactful other than that the story for the most part the political side of stuff was interesting the battle side of stuff, I'm not familiar with like a lot of the terminology used in the battle. So I'm sitting there like, well, what's going on? I've learned some things though. The next book in the series is Valiant. I'm excited to see how that's going to go. I'm hoping it goes better than this one. I hope we don't make this a trend of repeating scenes from previous books. I hope that's not what we do in the next book because that definitely hurt the experience with this book. So thank you for tuning into this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you liked it, give it a like, a comment, and be sure to subscribe to my channel for some more amazing content. Be sure to check out my previous content. I do write books. I don't just read them. So be sure to go pick you up one of those if you're interested, and I'll see you next time.